After spending four days trapped in the infamous Tower of London, condemned prisoner Queen Anne Boleyn wrapped up a small, desperate package and sent it to her volatile husband, King Henry VIII. It was a last letter to her beloved king, scrawled in cramped, painful handwriting. In it, Anne begged for mercy for the sake of their daughter, Elizabeth, but she also made one final, heartbreaking revelation. But how did Queen Anne Boleyn get here? In many ways, Anne Boleyn was born to be great. Her father, Thomas Boleyn, was the court favorite of the old King Henry VII, and the Boleyns were one of Britain's top families at the time. In 1513, Anne took up a position as maid of honor to Queen Mary of France. This was crucial for one simple reason. Queen Mary was none other than Henry VIII's sister, and this meant that Anne would move closer to his inner circle. With Mary's help, Anne stayed in France for nearly seven years, soaking in its cosmopolitan culture and turning herself into a refined young woman. But that was far from all. The coquettish Anne had spent her time in France studying languages, dancing, and literature, but she had one particular scandalous skill. The French were masters at courtly love, elaborate and flirtatious games designed to keep both men at an arm's length and get them excited. And Anne, she was a champion at this. Even with this, she also had other ways of getting what she wanted. According to almost everyone who met her, Anne Boleyn was excruciatingly attractive, slim, with long, dark hair and brown eyes. Men thought she was utterly captivating, but not just for her looks alone. Her friends knew her as a lively, quick-witted, and charming girl who was often the smartest person in the room. But underneath the perfect facade, Boleyn was hiding something. For all that she was joyful and magnetic, Boleyn hid a little-known dark side. Beneath her sociable attitude, she was moody, sharp-tongued, and extremely quick to anger when she didn't get what she wanted. And soon enough, this temper would get her into deep trouble with Henry VIII. But for now, she was getting into an entirely different kind of mess. Her older sister, Mary Boleyn, was making quite a splash in King Henry's court, and proving herself to be quite the rival to Anne's beauty. Case in point, although Henry was currently married to Catherine of Aragon, he quickly took Anne's sister on as his mistress. Now, when Anne eventually got to Henry's court, she brought a secret weapon with her. Her incredible dancing ability. She became famous for her dancing, and no courtier seemed to be able to look away. As it happened, this is exactly how she caught Henry's attention. Anne used her sister Mary's high place in the king's bedroom to her full advantage. Soon, she made a jaw-dropping debut. On March 4, 1522, she danced with her sister at a public event at the royal palace. During the performance, Bolin vibrated with magnetic new girl energy, which earned the beautiful Anne loads of male admirers after her legendary dance, King Henry included. After all, the king's fling with Mary Bolin was winding down, and he had a taste for fresh meat coming from his favorite family. And this is when Anne dealt the king a legendary snub. She didn't go after the king. Oh no, she had a much different suitor in mind. At the time, Anne much preferred one of the other suitors at court, the dashing Henry Percy, who was the heir to the Earl of Northumberland. Boleyn poured all of her energy into captivating Percy's heart, not the king's and the pair had an intense romance together over the next days and weeks. In fact, Anne was so in love with Percy, she made a drastic decision. After long gazes and letter writing, Anne and her beau Percy couldn't wait anymore and got engaged in secret. And sure, this sounds extra romantic and intimate, but there was a disturbing reason for their secrecy. You see, Percy was already formally engaged to an entirely different woman, as it happened though, this was the least of Anne's problems. Anne and Percy were so dumb and in love, nobody else was on their side. Percy's father absolutely refused to support the match, and the young couple also failed to get any marital backing from Cardinal Wolsey, who was an important figure in court. In other words, they were royally screwed. Beaten down, they eventually had to give each other up and went their own ways. It was a gut-wrenching end for their young love but there might have been an even darker cause underneath the split. Some historians suggest that even this early on, King Henry had a serious eye for Anne Boleyn. Jealous of the attention Anne was getting from and giving to Percy, the king may have personally put the kibosh on their relationship, 
ordering Cardinal to forbid their marriage on pain of royal punishment. Now, when Anne came to the English court, she took place in the household of Henry's queen, Catherine of Aragon. And sleeping with your boss's husband is never a good look, and maybe that's part of why Anne kept Henry at bay at the beginning of their acquaintance. Nonetheless, once Percy was out of the way, Henry really began his wooing. With his rival down and out, King Henry really started pursuing Boleyn in 1526. His tactics came on strong. Besides heartily engaging in games of courtly love with the expert Anne, he also wrote her extravagant love letters complete with lavish presents to remind her of his affections. But his first gift to Anne was extremely telling. Over their courtship, Henry often sent over precious gemstones like pearls and rubies to Anne, as long as he could stash them away from his wife, Catherine, of course. But his initial gift to Anne really takes the cake here. His very first letter included an elegant gold bracelet that was set with his own portrait. Maybe the narcissism turned Anne off because she sure didn't react very well. While Henry was throwing every trick in the book at Anne, she was still not interested. In fact, Anne specifically refused to bed him. And even after Henry promised he would promote her to chief mistress, she still turned him down. Anne's rejection of one of the most powerful men in Europe might seem bizarre. Although Anne may have been hung up over Percy, some believe her refusals had nothing to do with this. Instead, she was simply playing the long game. Anne wanted to be much more than a mistress. She wanted Henry to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon and make her queen. As it turned out, Anne's timing in courting Henry was impeccable. When she arrived on the scene, Henry's marriage was majorly on the rocks. For one, although Queen Catherine had given birth to Princess Mary, aka Bloody Mary, the aging woman hadn't given Henry his much-coveted male heir. But there was an even bigger issue, and one that Anne would take full advantage of. King Henry started to get deranged ideas. He decided that since Queen Catherine had briefly married his older brother, Prince Arthur, before the prince died, God was mad at him for stealing his brother's wife, and this was the reason why he didn't have a son. And while Catherine swore she never consummated the union, it was no good. Henry began angling for the annulment, which was the only way the Catholic Church would condone him remarrying Anne. So when Henry started talking about chucking Catherine out the door, Anne was thrilled. Although she still kept Henry away from her bed, she happily accepted his proposal of marriage. And although he was already married, the lovebirds assumed it would be the snap of a finger to oust Queen Catherine. Now this very infamously did not go well. Of course, we now know that Henry's annulment was no easy feat, but few know Anne's dark role in the proceedings. Tag teaming with Henry, she began campaigning Cardinal Wolsey, the same man who had nixed her wedding to Henry Percy, to support her new romantic ambitions. And when Cardinal couldn't convince the church to annul the royal union, Anne's wrath was bone chilling. In the beginning, Anne played sweet at the English court, hiding the same infamous temper she always had. But now, she hit the roof. Aghast at Cardinal's failure, she turned on him like a rabid dog. Within months, she had a direct hand in getting him charged with high treason, and the stressed and aging Cardinal died soon after. Still, this revenge wasn't enough for Anne. She tasted the power, and she would soon come back for more. Anne toiled on the sidelines with Henry for years, but that didn't mean she was a wallflower. As time went on, she inserted herself more and more into a ruling role. But as Anne rose to power, her desperation deepened. Throughout all of Henry and Anne's plotting, Catherine of Aragon remained staunch in her conviction that she was the one true queen of England, and in response, the illicit couple made her pay for it. The king and his mistress wheeled at Catherine constantly to get the heck out, with Henry once even suggesting that Catherine join a covent. Catherine's legendary response, quote, God never called me to a nunnery. I am the king's true and legitimate wife, quote. And with that avenue shut down real quick, Henry and Anne turned to much crueler measures. In the summer, Henry literally abandoned his wife, moving his court without telling Catherine or his daughter Mary. In a letter, Catherine complained that Henry didn't even wake her up to say goodbye, presumably because he was too busy with Anne Boleyn, and the couple really twisted the knife in. In another show of his undenying devotion to Anne, Henry forbid Catherine from stepping foot in his new court, and in the meantime, gave her royal chambers to Anne Boleyn. Catherine later said of the trials, quote, It is enough to shorten ten lives, much more mine, quote. Yet just as Anne had come so close to what she wanted, 
it all backfired on her because to the surprise of zero people, the public did not take well to the idea of Anne becoming queen. After all, the common crowds absolutely adored Catherine and blamed Boleyn for splitting apart the marriage. As Anne cemented her position, the grumblings only got louder, with people calling her cruel names and accusing her of winning Henry over with witchcraft. Henry and Anne's difficulty in securing an annulment was so drawn out, people began calling it the King's Great Matter. Finally, after seven long years of fighting with the church, Henry had quite enough, and the king's actions changed history. He infamously split the Roman Catholicism entirely and installed himself as the head of the brand new Anglican church. And with no more middlemen, Henry finally pushed through with his divorce from Catherine of Aragon. Anne and Henry had finally gotten what they wanted, and they moved fast. In 1533, it finally happened. After much planning and even more years, Anne Boleyn became the Queen Consort of England, marrying Henry on January 25th. But there is one thing about the union no one knew. The power couple had already married each other in a super secret ceremony the previous November, and that wasn't all. Since their covert wedding, Anne had very much let Henry into her bedroom, so much so that when Anne had her formal ceremony in January, she was already pregnant with Henry's child. Still, Anne was certainly not leaning into the wife and mother roles. She was now pregnant, Queen of England, and more powerful and smug than she had ever been. Or in other words, there was nowhere to go but down. After her coronation, Anne settled into royal life and prepared to give Henry his long-desired son, and indeed, all signs pointed to a boy. Almost all of the king's astrologers said the stars mapped out a male heir, and Anne and Henry were so confident they were about to welcome a son, but instead, Anne was entering into a horrible nightmare. In September 1533, Anne gave birth to a healthy child, but not to a boy. She had a little girl, the future Queen Elizabeth, and the shock sent both the royal couple into tailspin. Henry cancelled his celebratory It's a Boy jousting match, and the royal scribes hastily changed Prince to Princess in their official announcement, and Anne didn't know it then, but this was the beginning of the end. Henry and Anne were both hotheads, and their relationship was already extremely volatile. One man characterized it as Storm followed Sunshine, Sunshine followed Storm. So when Anne didn't immediately give Henry a male heir, the king's patient with his testy wife went right down the drain. He began to resent her sharp intelligence and even sharper tongue. Over the next three years, Anne was likely pregnant another two times after having Elizabeth, but tragically suffered through miscarriages each time. After a while, Henry grew even more distant and even more regretful that he'd married her in the first place. By 1536, she was on thin ice. And then her Hail Mary came. In early 1536, Anne was pregnant again and more sure than ever that she was going to deliver Henry a healthy boy and cement her position as his consort. She did everything by the book, taking care of her body and staying away from the stressful situations to ensure she would never have a miscarriage again. And then suddenly, a grisly event brought Henry back to her. In January 1536, King Henry and Queen Anne got word that Henry's ex-wife Catherine of Aragon had died. Their response was so disturbing, it's impossible to forget. The royal couple was so overjoyed at the news. The next day, they even dressed up in jubilant yellow clothing to celebrate the occasion. But if they had known the truth of Catherine's end, they might have thought twice. Because when Catherine of Aragon passed, doctors opened her body to find that her heart had turned completely black. This was bad news for Anne because suddenly, the court began to whisper that Boleyn had poisoned the former queen just to get her out of the way. While we know now that Catherine had heart cancer, it did nothing to strengthen Anne's PR at the time. But by then, there were even darker problems at play. King Henry always had a wandering eye, and when his marriage to Anne started fraying, he turned his attentions elsewhere, namely to the pretty, sweet, second cousin of Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour who would eventually become his third wife. Now Anne still had her pregnancy as the ace up her sleeve, but it was all about to come crashing down. Despite their family ties, Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour weren't exactly close. More than that, Anne Boleyn was no dummy. She knew that a relationship was growing between Henry and Jane under her nose. In fact, in one incident, Boleyn discovered that Henry had given Jane his picture to wear in a locket around her neck just like the bracelet he had once gifted her. And then it started to get real messy. One evening, Anne walked into a room, only to find the treasonous Jane sitting prettily on her husband's lap. Anne's response went down in infamy, giving in to her notorious temper. 
and reportedly flew into a public rage at the sight of Jane Seymour lounging atop King Henry VIII. Now Anne was already on edge, but she had one more shock coming. Around this time, King Henry VIII participated in a jousting tournament with Anne watching on from the sidelines. In front of her eyes, an opponent unhorsed Henry with such force that the king was unconscious for a good two hours. In the end, all of this stress was too much for Anne, and the consequences were devastating. Just five days after Henry's disastrous tournament, Anne miscarried yet again, losing the child she was so desperate to give Henry. That's not even the most disturbing part. When the attendants looked at the infant Anne had just miscarried, they saw that it was a boy. And even though Henry had helped cause the drama, he now blamed Boleyn entirely for the miscarriage. When the Imperial Ambassador heard the news, he apparently intoned that Anne had miscarried her savior and he was way too correct. When King Henry VIII turned on Anne at last, his spite was swift and brutal. After all, he had spent an agonizing near decade splitting from Catherine of Aragon, and he had no intention of doing the same with Anne. But at this time, his punishment was so much worse than divorce. Henry's plan of attack started with a series of snubs to Anne. While his poor queen recovered from her traumatic miscarriage, Henry started telling people Anne had indeed bewitched him into marrying her. And then he turned to public humiliation. Within days of losing his narcissistic love for Anne, Henry had installed Jane in the royal quarters. With this done, Henry worked on the bloodiest phase of the plan. By the end of April, Henry initiated some serious sinister moves on Anne's friends and family. The king detained and questioned a series of male courtiers who knew Anne, accusing many of them of sleeping with his witchy wife. Now yes, it is clear that Henry was off to the deep end, but it wasn't going to get any better. In early May, Henry pulled the trigger on his malevolent plot. He arrested his wife for high treason. It being treasonous for the queen to sleep with anyone but her king, and he threw her into the infamous Tower of London to await her fate. Upon her detainment, Anne apparently collapsed from the shock. Right after Henry's men told her of the charges, Olin went back to her room and got changed into an exquisite crimson velvet dress. Anne wanted to make sure that when the men led her to the tower, she looked every part of the queen, showing Henry exactly what he was going to be missing. Still, none of this saved her from her utterly tragic fate. In mid-May, King Henry finally put Anne on trial. While she stood there, her brother George suffering through a similar trial on the same day. The crown accused her of everything from witchcraft to plotting Henry's death so she could remarry. By then, it was far too late for rebuttals. A jury of 27 people found Anne guilty on all counts and condemned her and George to execution. With the King of England breathing down their necks, the jury didn't have any chance to enact justice, and many might have actually believed in Anne's innocence. Henry may have claimed Anne was treasonous, but the truth behind Boleyn's trial is tragic. According to most experts, Henry really did just have her killed because she didn't give him male children as quickly as he wanted. And in accordance to her so-called crimes, Anne was supposed to be burned at the stake. However, King Henry was merciful enough to commute this fate to a much pleasanter beheading. In her final days in the tower, visitors to the Queen of England described her as eerily calm and even happy. Perhaps this is why she uttered some utterly chilling last words. She was reportedly chatting with a guard about her professional executioner, and in an attempt to reassure herself, she said, quote, I hear he's quite good, and I have a very small neck." Quote, we may know what Anne Boleyn was really thinking in her final, desperate days. She likely wrote the poem, O oh Death, Rock Me Asleep, composing it during her very last hours on earth. In it, Boleyn seems to grapple with her impending death, writing how the execution will release her from her sorrows. After four days in the tower, Boleyn bundled up a package and gave it to her guard to deliver to the king. It was a letter her very last to Henry. In it, she pled for mercy, writing that, quote, Never prince had wife more loyal in all duty and in all true affection than you have ever found in Anne Boleyn. Quote, she also made one final, heartbreaking request. In her final letter to King Henry, Boleyn begged him to think of their daughter Elizabeth, and then she humbly asked that Henry would spare the lives of her brother and the other men accused of being her lovers. It's a wrenching revelation. At her core, until the very end, Boleyn may have been truly selfless. And on May 19th, 1935, Anne Boleyn walked to her own execution. Historians aren't exactly sure when Anne was born, 
but to our best guesses, she was between 28 and 35 years young when she was executed. From the lost romances, the twisted relationships, and the heartbreaking end to Anne's life, let us know your thoughts on Anne Boleyn's life down in the comments below. And if you're interested in more historical stories on infamous figures, subscribe to the Factonate channel so you don't miss out on any of our great content.